It doesn't say anything. Okay. Oh, show the following procedure. Procedure generates. Okay. So that you do, that's conceptual. Then suppose you have uniform distributed integers one through hundred. Okay. Well, we'll have to discuss that next week. Then how would we do? This there's a little. So the homework number uh, two, uh, number three, has a little computing in it. Okay. This kind of this author uh, kind of is a uh, proponent of making sure to get some computing in your life when it comes to the statistics course. So uh, I'm going to attempt some of those problems myself. Use whatever computer you want. Yeah, MATLAB will work. I think I said I would support Maple and MATLAB in here, so I'll try writing it in both the Maple and MATLAB. MATLAB. Maybe we should just go with MATLAB. How many people are MATLAB users? How many people are Maple users? How many people are C users? <laughs> CS department. How many people are not users at all? Okay, how many people would think they wouldn't be able to write a program? Just, I don't know. It sounds like it's an issue, a minor issue. Uh, I saw a lot of MATLABs. So, maybe I should try to support them. Lectures, which I'm going to give after I the lecture. Um, okay, so you step in the homework. I've heard all your comments about that. <laughs> 67 was hard. Okay, um, well, what about notes three? Any questions about it? Anybody look at it so far? Scheme it? Yeah. Okay. Where should we get? We should, there's a number of things that has to do with uh, joint densities, joint frequency functions. Uh, marginal densities, marginal frequency functions, and conditional densities, and also conditional frequency functions, but I don't think I put conditional frequency functions in here, but you are going to have a conditional frequency function for problem, for the grad problem uh, next week somewhere. I mean, probably, actually, two weeks from today. Any questions about homework number two? Yeah. How do you do start on uh, 16? 16. Okay, let's talk about starting number 16. What is the probability density of time? Okay. I thought you might ask about that. <clears throat> That's actually not difficult, but I can give a hint. Okay, how would you... Okay. So... What you have is you have um, in problem 16, chapter 3.16, what you have is you have an uh, independent, independent random variables. What does that mean? That means f of x, y equals f of x times f of y, right? Yeah, in terms of the joint density? Yeah. Yeah, we didn't discuss joint density yet, so... Uh, but I can write it this way. It means probability T, T1 less than or equal to little t1, comma, capital T2 less than or equal to little t2 is equal to the product of the probabilities. This is in terms of the joint CDF. This is actually the joint CDF is defined by this way. Okay, where comma means and, so this is the intersection of two events. All right, I'm sorry, I wrote the same thing down. It means times here. Okay, capital P two equals the CDF of the first variable, which I'm going to denote by a subscript. Capital P one times the CDF of the second variable. Okay, so. One definition of independence of two real random variables is that 
that this is true for all values of the variables. T1, T2, little t1, little t2. Well, I mean, I use x and y, so I use subscripts instead. So the problem is kind of set up that way. I how it wasn't set up in the example E of section 3.4. Yeah, you use little t1, little t2. Okay. So that's the definition of independence. Definition of independence. Okay. So we equal that for all t1 and t2. Now, and then by differentiating, uh, you get the joint density. So, uh, if and only, okay, if I now take uh, the, the, the second partial of x to t1 and t2, uh, f of t1 is equal, now I take that as equal to partial with respect to capital F of t1 and t2. Uh, Subscript, yeah. okay, you could use it. All right, equals, uh, this is the joint density. If not the joint density, which is F of T1, T2, equals this, equals to the product of, this is not a full proof that's indicating what's going on. How do you get the joint density from the joint CDF? You take the second partial derivative with respect to the two variables. I didn't define what a joint density was. So you might say, well, why is that true? <laughs> okay, what is the joint density? How, how is the joint density? What is the representation where, in general, I know it's a little bit bad, but I'm much nicer in my notes, but I'm trying to get the quick way to just have all the motions defined. Where, in general, uh, what is the joint density? What you do is you, you, you the joint density is assumed to have the following form. If I have the joint CDF, then I'm going to write minus infinity to x, minus infinity to y, f of u, v, d, uh, u, d, v, uh, infinity, u, v, d, v, right? Okay. This is where, for some piecewise continuous function f of u v greater than or equal to zero with the total integral f of u uh, u v d v d u equal to one. So there's a density, okay, well, we'll, if this is the case uh, of a continuous random variable, okay, where in general uh, a continuous Join the continuous pair. Of random variables. X, Y. Let's go to Has CDF. It's has a joint CDF. We call it a joint CDF. Of this form, okay. So, in particular, if you have independent random variables, each of which is continuous, then you do have a joint CDF given by the product of the two so called marginal, excuse me, a joint uh, PDF, joint PDF given by the product of the so called marginal. PDFs, probability density function, PDF. So this is a PDF, okay, this is a this is a marginal PDF. This is a marginal PDF. So when I use this subscript notation, but it is just the PDF of T1. 
right? This is just the probability density function of T2. Okay, I think I've confused people a little bit. So what I did is here, I, I've taken this definition of any kind of random variables. Okay, in terms of the so-called marginal. Why, why marginal? CDF. It's just the CDF of capital T1, but it's also sometimes called the marginal CDF. Why? Why would it sometimes be called the marginal CDF? you had marginal sums on the bottom and on the right side. Yeah, and marginal sums. So basically it has to do with summation. Uh, but it doesn't really come into play until we actually talk about marginal probability density functions or marginal frequency functions. And then just the word marginal gets carried along to the cumulative distribution function. This author is a bit peculiar in that he actually discusses cumulative distribution functions to a large extent. Most authors won't even bother with the CDF. Okay, they'll just go directly to the density. This is the key, the key, uh, the key player in terms of making computations. This author is a little bit uh, more, you know, um, persnickety in the conceptual issue of the cumulative distribution function brought into play quite a bit more than. So, okay, so there's the uh, representation we assume for the joint CDF, which is defined this way right here. Okay, this is the joint CDF. Joint cumulative distribution function. Joint CDF. There's a probability, which I put that way. So now let's go back to your problem. So now, what are these? Uh, how would I get that? The, the, how would I recover the joint density from the uh, joint cumulative distribution function? This is called the joint density. It's one t squared. Yeah, but in general, how would I recover? You see, how, how do I get this function from that function? If I have the capital F of x, y, how do I get the little f of x, y? Differentiate. Differentiate by the fundamental theorem of calculus. Remember that? Um, you probably remember for a single integral. <laughs> All right. Let me just do that. Yeah, you take the second partial derivative. So you, to get the x in here and the y in here, you take the second partial derivative with respect to x and y. Then all the integral signs go away. So you have properties of this joint CDF that's non negative. Uh, it's just between 0 and 1. It's not decreasing each variable separately. And it has a limit 1 as x and y go to infinity, and has a limit 0 as x and y go to minus but that problem doesn't really give me the CDF, does it? No, we could actually construct it. But let's just go ahead and now, I just wanted to get the definition of these. Uh -huh. So now let's go ahead and look at the joint density then. So what is the joint density in your problem? 316 joint density. It's very simple by independence because then it's just uh, f of t1, t2 is equal to f of t1, little t1, times f of t2, little t2. And these are the uniform densities. So that's just 1 over t, 0 less or equal to t, 1 less or equal to capital T, and 0 else, times, that's a function of t1, times a function of t2, which is of the same form. Okay, so I multiply those two functions. They're both functions in the whole real line, right? They're you have this function, and then you also, and this is of t1, and then you also have 1 of t2, okay, which is exactly the same shape. Okay, you multiply those, and you get a function of two variables, which is simply 1 over capital T squared for both variables t1 and t2, 0 and t, capital T, and 0 else. So 
that is your joint density. And normally what we'll do is we'll draw a picture of the, of the place where the joint density is non-zero. The region of the plane where the joint density is non-zero is simply the square, capital T by capital T. So this is the, where this is the little t1 axis, this is the little t2 axis, and this is just the square, capital T by capital T on each side. Is everybody clear about that? That's what this region is here. This is just the square. Okay. So what you have is you have a constant density on a region of the plane. So now we're talking about joint density. We'll use it if we want. We'll just short density. Okay, when we know we're talking about a random pair. So if you think about it, uh, this density being constant, in other words, if I filled it, if I made a picture of the density uh, by gray levels, so to speak, in other words, where the, the darkness of the picture corresponds to the height of the density, then I would have a constant gray level on this whole square, right? And where, and then I'd have white on the outside. If there's no, there's not, the density is supposed to be zero there, so zero gray level. Okay, so, so there's a solid darkness across this with no differentiation right, in gray levels. Is everybody clear with that? So it corresponds to just putting dots down at random, filling up the whole space and not leaving, and, and, and not leaving any spaces bare. Okay, so you can simulate this thing. Just put an ink dots down, uniformly at random. Okay. Is everybody clear about that? That's the picture. Now, um, so in particular, that means the pair, capital T1, capital T2, is said to be uniformly distributed on the square. On the square, zero less or equal to t1 less or equal to capital T, zero less or equal to t2 less or equal to capital T, because on the square. Region, square, region. Because the density is constant there and zero otherwise. That's the definition of a uniform distributed random variable, uh, random pair. Density should be constant on a region and zero otherwise. Okay, I think I put that down in my notes, beginning of note four or something like that. If you miss the notes, uh, just come get them in class. Okay. Or in my office. Does everybody know I do have office hours before class and also um, I have office hours from 1.45 to 2.30. I have to, but I'm Thursday, no, let's see, it depends on colloquium days. See, there's a problem because I go to a colloquium right after the class. So I have to skip an hour. But if it's not a colloquium day, you can come right after the class. You can check on the website. The math department website has the colloquium advertised, so you can check to see whether there's a colloquium that day. And on certain Tuesdays after class, there are department meetings, so those are less common. So it's pretty common you can find me Tuesday after class. Okay? You're okay. Otherwise, can't make any of those times, let me know. We'll make some other arrangements. <clears throat> okay, so that's uniform and vertical. So let's go back to your exercise. Now, what's the question? The, they actually work something out in the problem. Yeah, but the thing is, we couldn't figure out what is. They ask you what's the distribution or density for T1 minus T2. Okay, in absolute value. Yeah. Actually, is it an absolute value they asked for? That's the question. question. Yeah. Okay. So, how do you do that? This is, so, let's have an application. So, two packets are coming in, and, and and capital T1 minus capital T2 is the the distance the time between them. Or two friends are decide they're going to meet for lunch between 12 and 12:30, and they both arrive randomly at the rendezvous point. 
Okay, and that's the time that the first one there has to wait. Okay. So maybe the randomly arriving strategy is not that great. <laughs> okay, you might think, but. Um, Those are two ideas. So then you have the probability that what the what the authors calculate then is the probability in example E. The authors calculate the probability that the absolute value of t1 minus t2 is less than or equal to tau. That's what they've done. Now that's how do you calculate a probability in general? We have jointly distributed random variables. How would you do it? Well, the utility of the density, what's this, what is this density good for? We have to know the interpretation of the density. F of uh, x, y, d, x, d, y is approximately the probability that capital X belongs to little x to x plus b x is, in, is near x and jointly y is near little y. So how would I calculate the probability that capital X, Y belongs to some region, A, of the space, of the, of the plane? So then the probability that X, Y falls in some region, A, okay, is simply going to be, by summing these probabilities, over all the little, uh, I'm going to look at the little rectangles in A, right? I'm going to break up A into little pieces. And I'm going to say, well, I know what the probability of each of these little, the probability that x, y belongs to this little piece is, okay? In other words, percentage, if I think of dots being put down on the plane, okay, for all the possible random pairs x, y that I would see, I want the percentage of the dots that are in this region A among all the dots that are in the plane, okay? So I look, well, I could look at, add up the percentages in each, in each of these little squares. But according to this calculus rule, I know what those percentages are according to the joint density. I know what the percentage lie in each of these little squares is that. Okay? Then I add them. That means integrate. Okay? So this would be double integral over A of the joint density. Okay? So that's the utility of the joint density. That I can find probabilities by integration. So, what our joint density is particularly easy. So, in our particular case, I have to now. This is a. This can be written in the form of capital X, capital Y belongs to A, right? All I have to do is just uh, figure out what this region looks like in terms of capital T1 and capital T2, right? That's just. In other words, I put the little T1 and little T2 in. Tau is fixed here. I look at the set of points that little T1 minus little T2 and absolute values goes to the tau. So I have my region A is a set of all T1, T2, such that absolute T1 minus little T2 is us root of the top. That's the situation here, right? So so I have to look at that inside, and I only have to look, obviously, obviously only in this equation, I also only have to integrate, I can put another thing in, that's intersect with the region in which f is non-zero, okay? So only have to consider the points a that are inside the square, right? Any part of a that goes outside the square, I can cut it off, right? I will cut it off. So here I look at the set where t1 minus t2 is also equal to with tau, well that means uh, it's pairs t1, t2 that are near the diagonal of the square. T1 is equal to T2, right? I mean, intuitively, you think about the problem in terms of people doing the lunch, okay? They'll come exactly at the same time along the diagonal of the square, right? Which has zero probability, okay? Because it's, you know, just the, the line would have zero probability coming exactly at the same time. But then I can kind of fatten this diagonal up, and now this is the region. T1 minus T2 and absolute value, I'll see the top. You just have to do a little bit of 
uh, algebra, right? Or to, to work this out. You can write it as minus tau less or equal to t1 minus t2 less or equal to tau and figure out the two boundaries of this region. Okay. So you have tau here, tau here, okay, these straight lines parallel to the diagonal. So I won't go through that part of it. So now how would I calculate the product? So that's my region A now. So I just calculate the uh, double integral of this constant function over A. So I have to calculate the double integral of probability equals this uh, double integral over A of the constant one over capital T squared. T2 dt1. Okay? Well, what do you figure that is? That's just the ratio of the area of A to the um, area of the square. Because here's the area of the square, it's capital T squared. And then I'll have the area. So I can put, in other words, I can take this capital T squared because it's constant outside, right? So I can write this as the area, the integral of 1, divided by capital T squared. Okay. So it's just a rate, so it's just a, it's just the area of A divided by capital T squared, the area of the square, where I put absolute value for area. This, this is going down here, and I'm getting this. Okay? Pretty chemistry, red. More or less, better More or less. <laughs> Or else barely. Oh, because it's right. It doesn't come in color. Oh yeah, this is color. On the TV. So I'm well, on this, it's just it's a that liquid crystal display. Okay. So, so for a uniform random variable, the, the probability that the pair it belongs to a subregion of the original region is just um, the ratio of the areas. Okay. So it's a simple idea. And so then they calculate this, right? Because they do the job. In that example, then how would I find the? Uh, so now that I can think of it as a random variable now. It's called a capital D for distance or uh, whatever you want to call it. Capital tau is a little trouble, so I don't want to think of capital tau. But uh, <laughs> that's a random variable, right? Give it a name. So if I have the, then it means I have the cumulative distribution function, and I have an invariable. Now how do I find the density? Let's take the derivative with respect to tau. So this is a trivial problem. Well, <laughs> well all this work, so this problem is trivial. <laughs> you take the answer like that and differentiate with respect to tau. Time between the packets, right? Uh huh. Okay, give it. Let's give it a name. Uh, capital delta T or something. All right. So capital delta. I'll call it capital delta just for the, to give it a simple thing. So that's my random variable. All right. So I have, I have the CDF of capital delta now. So uh, F sub capital delta of tau. Okay, is equal to. They actually told you how to do it. What's the trick in this, by the way? They say the probability that's less than the tau is one minus the probability that's bigger than tau. If bigger than tau, you can find the areas of these two triangles. Yeah. Okay. So this is capital. This distance is capital T minus tau. The area of the uh, two triangles adds up to capital T minus tau squared. This is one half times capital T minus. These obviously are the same. Okay. Triangles by symmetry. The area of a triangle, right triangle. Well, one half the base times the height, okay? Or any triangle, but in particular, easy to see that. One half the base times the height, okay? So then you have this is one minus twice one half times capital T minus tau squared, okay? Equals one minus capital T minus tau squared. Let's see if that makes sense. When tau is zero, um, 
gives us for zero x when tau is equal to capital T. When tau is, I'm sorry, this should be uh, divided by, I'm sorry, this should be the total area x t squared divided by t squared. I need, well, this is a probability, so I need to divide this by capital T squared. Maybe that's the easiest way. Okay, this is a, one is a probability, but I have to make this a probability, so I need to divide the area by capital T squared. That's correct. Now let's check it. When tau is zero, I should have the cumulative distribution function zero. When tau is t, I should have the cumulative distribution function one. When tau is zero, it comes out one minus one. When tau is t, it comes out one minus zero. Okay, so that's correct. F of, F of zero is zero. And F of capital T is one. All right, so that looks good anyway. So we checked it. And so this now I just take this function and differential with respect to tau. That's my density. Because the derivative of the uh, distribution function is the density. I didn't just because I didn't know how to make a capital tau, I couldn't, you know, match this letter with this button. That's the only problem. <laughs> Why do you have to take the, why are we looking at the... This is the distribution outside. function technique, by the way. This is the distribution function technique. But my we question... Find the CDF and the differential. But my question is, why are we looking at the outside triangles? That's the part I don't Why know. did you look at that? Just to make it easier. I don't want to have to calculate this area. I don't want to bring out trapezoidal areas and all that junk. I don't want to break, how do I break this area? I have to break it out to do something. So I did the complementation trick. Uh, In other words, it's easier to find a probability that is bigger than tau. Because there's two triangles. Uh, yeah. Okay. okay. Now you got it. Now I get it. Okay. Now similarly, actually, and I did this in today's notes, what's the uh, probability, just what's the uh, density of the sum of two independent operators? Maybe we should go through that. Let's do the same thing. Get another application. Of what's the density of the sum? So with uh, of two independent kind of variables. This is the distribution function technique. I think that's why the author spent so much time on it. He wanted to talk about transformations around variables and things like that via the distribution function technique. So the idea is you, with the, uh, you could calculate this probability. And this is sufficiently nice that I can calculate this probability for every tau, and therefore I can compute the CDF and therefore the EDF my differentiation. What's the probability, what's the CDF, excuse me, what's the uh, joint density of capital T1 plus capital T2? Call that capital S, so then I can actually have a name for that. That's the sum. Okay, S equals. Is it bright enough in here to see that T1 plus T2? What's the joint density of that? Well, I'll do the same trick. I'll look at the. I'll first I'll find the the cumulative distribution function capital S equals the probability that T uh, that Capital S is less than little s, which is the probability that capital T1 plus capital T2 is less than equal to little s. Now let's read in terms of capital T1 and capital T2. But I know the joint density of capital T1 and capital T2. So I just have to find the region capital T1 plus capital T2 less than equal to s. What does that look like? Here's capital T1 plus capital T2 equals to S. It makes these um, diagonal lines crossing the square. Right? This is for S bigger than capital T, but less than capital 2 times capital T. This would be, uh, this would be the capital T1 plus capital T2 equals to T1 
2 capital T. Right, this is the point T, T here. Capital T, capital T. So S is, what is S going to range between? 0 and 2T. Right. So I want to find this for S is going to be between 0 and 2 capital T. Everybody kind of following that? That picture over there? And I just have to find now uh, the area of this region, then divide by capital T squared for each S. That doesn't look too hard, right? I'll break it. Should we break any cases? Does it need to be broken in cases? I think it does because you hear something kind of changes after this diagonal. So I'm going to look at S less than the capital T and S bigger than capital T. All right, there's two cases. Make it easy. Zero less than S less than equal to capital T. Then my line T1 plus T2 equals to S. T1 plus T2 equals to S here. Well, this this uh, line, which is crossing the square, is actually going to be near the origin, right? So then I'll be down here, okay, below this black line here, toward the origin. And so now the probability that I'm down because I'm just looking at the area of a triangle divided by the area of the square, right? So that one was pretty easy. Two cases. So this first one is then capital F of S, uh, well, and then I'm going to take uh, capital T less than the S less than the capital, two times capital T. So let's take it first. One, this is one and this is two. In case one, then I have uh, capital F of S is equal to the area of the region. If I'm down here, then this line cuts off at S. I think that's pretty easy to see, right? So then I just have one half times s times s divided by the area, or it's the ratio of areas divided by capital T squared. Okay? Let's see, I do this somewhere on page two of these notes, so I'm make sure I'm getting it right. Okay? And then uh, this is for zero loss uh, zero loss from the S loss equal to capital T. And then for part two, I have, let's say, capital F of S is one. Well, now I have all the area underneath this red line here, okay? All this area over here. Well, I can just subtract, right? So it's one minus ratio of areas of the small triangle up here. So what is that small triangle up there? What's the, what is this business? I have to figure out how, how large this is. And then one minus S. Well, T minus S. It's, um, <laughs> this, you have to figure it out, okay, how big that is.
comes out to be, if I divide through by the t, it comes out 1 minus 1 half 2 minus s over t quantity squared. Okay, so now I found the distribution function. Okay, now I need to find the density. We have to differentiate with respect to s. Okay. So you have to do a little bit of calculation. It's not real bad. And then you take the derivative. So now what's the density look like? Let's see if it makes sense in the end. It's, it's, that's the main thing. So what does the density look like? Oh, this is for the sum. So it's just the density, a function of one variable, right? It's a function of s. So I now have little f of s is d by ds, capital F of s. And that comes out to be, this capital T is a constant. Uh, so I get uh, 1 half times s squared goes to s, right? So s over t squared, or 0 less or equal to s less or equal to capital T. And then I have to differentiate this little guy. Okay, so one is going to differentiate to zero, the minus one half. Okay, that's going to stay there. Then I'm going to bring a two down, cancel the half. And what's going to have the minus sign? Under the chain rule, the minus sign will go away too. I'll have another one over t. So I'm going to get uh, two minus s over t times one over t. Um, capital T less or s less or Basically, you need an s over t times 1 over t. So if you want to make the two pieces look the same, then you can write it this way. s over t is between 0 and 1. And then you have this times 1 over t. But that just is, is necessary because the length of the interval is capital T. If you reduce this to the case capital T equals to 1, which is the case it's the sum of two uniform variables, right? capital T equals to 1 gives something much simpler, right? Then little f of and I'm talking about the sum of uh, two independent uniform random variables distributed on the unit interval. Then I get uh, f of s is equal to simply s. For zero less or equal to s less or equal to one. And two minus s for one less or equal to s less or equal to two. Okay, that's a lot simpler looking, isn't it? <laughs> okay. And so it simply looks like this. Okay. The triangular shape density goes up to 1, goes over here to 2. This is the s-axis. The density goes up to height 1. So the area under this curve is indeed 1. You get by the area of a triangle formula. Okay. So that's the density. So it's nasty with the capital T in there, really. This is kind of a, a nuisance parameter here. But there it is. Okay. So ratios of areas and so on. The capital T is to remind you that you're supposed to take a ratio of areas. Okay. That's the only value in it, <laughs> it seems. Otherwise, it's just meant to double stick. <clears throat> uh, any more questions? That's one problem. <laughs> and a little bit more. But now you've seen joint density. And now maybe we should go back and look at, at the uh, joint frequency functions for a moment and see. And we need to come back to joint density also because you haven't seen one where the density wasn't constant yet. And also the problem of the marginal density hasn't come in. But let's get the marginal frequency function first. So let's see if we can run through that, run through a few pictures here. Let's go back to the discrete case, notes 3, page 6. I want to look at a, um, a joint frequency function.
have discrete uh, variables, I have two of them now, then I can talk about the joint frequency function. Yj equals the probability that capital X equals little xi and capital Y equals little yj. So this kind of uh, corresponds to the joint density. Uh, equation uh, corresponds to This is the joint frequency function. It corresponds to f of x, y, d, x, d, y equals the probability of capital X is near little x. Capital Y is near little y. Okay, so this is probability on both sides. This is probability on both sides. This is an infinitesimal probability because dx and dy are infinitesimals. But that's true. So this is the frequency function corresponding to this, this interpretation. I should put this double tilde. It's not equal until you take divide by dx dy on both sides and take dx and dy go to zero. Alright? So how would you actually display a joint uh, frequency function? Well you could do it with a table if you had only finitely many values for each variable. So here's an example. We have PXY, and sometimes they put X's on the vertical axis, and sometimes X's on the horizontal axis here in this example. I'm going to put X going down and Y going across. So, one, two, three. I'm just going to give an example of a table of probabilities where the probabilities add to one. And so, a very simple way to do that is I'm going to put in one tenth. Not in every place, right? Because there are 16 places to put one, but I can put one tenth. <laughs> if I put one tenth in everywhere, that's too many. Um, so I'm going to put in some zeros. Oops. Zero, 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 zero. Okay, so I have 10 one tenths, and those add up to one. Okay. Now, <laughs> what could I do? So that's the PXY, as uh, tabulated. Right? So P31, which is P13. This is P13, where the X is 1 and Y is 3. Right here. P13 is 0. Uh, P13. Actually, what I have is a discrete uniform distribution here. Okay. A uniform distribution on a set of pairs of integers. Okay. Because it's constant on that set of pairs. And zero everywhere else. The frequency function is constant. It's actually called discrete uniform. A joint distribution. Alright, so what? Well, What are the marginal frequency functions? Now the margin comes in. So what's the marginal frequency function of capital X according to this diagram? So what's the probability that capital X equals little x? That would be the marginal frequency function of capital X. So I'll just write a piece of capital X, little x. Because I don't want to use the little p too many times. <laughs> okay, I need to differentiate. P was used as the function of two variables here. Now I want to designated function of one variable capital X subscript here. <clears throat> How would I do that? How would I calculate that? What's the probability that capital X equals one or zero? What's the probability? So what's the probability that capital X is equal to zero? What is it? Well, uh, that would be the I would have to take into account 
have all possibilities for y. Partitioning the uh, probability space by uh, by cross classification, you know, cross classification, x and y. So I would just take all possibilities for y. Y is zero, one, two, or three. Right. So I would just add up the terms. So this would be the probability x equals to zero, and y is something. Y is one. 0, 1, 2, or 3. Okay. In other words, I, did, I write this as probably x equals 0 and y is less than infinity. <laughs> then I break it up do the cases for y. We'll assume that all we'll assume that all these that are random variables are finite. So, okay, so equal infinity is not going to be allowed. I break it up like that. So then that's just some that's just p zero zero plus p zero one plus p zero two plus p zero three. And so that means I add up this row here. X is zero. And therefore, I could get, uh, I could label this, now capital P, I could label this P sub capital X of X, and I get four tenths, three tenths, two tenths, and one tenth probabilities. And that's the marginal frequency function. So that's why it's called, that's why the word marginal comes in, because it's the margin of this table. Similarly, you can put in the marginal frequency function of y, piece of capital Y of little y, if I write down this one, and I get also four tenths, three tenths, two tenths, and one tenth. So from this joint frequency function that was uniform, I have that actually the, the uh, x and y, the variables that were involved in making this joint picture, were actually equally distributed because these are the same functions. Four tenths probably associated with two, the value of zero, three tenths associated with the value of one, two tenths associated with the value of two, and one tenth associated with the value of three. So we say x and y are equally distributed. That does not mean they're independent. They're equally distributed, have the same distribution. Right. No. Here, x and y are equally distributed. It's the same, same function. It's marginal. this table even more. How would I do that? What's the conditional, what are the conditional probabilities for x given that uh, y is equal to 2? Find the probability well let's see I'm gonna have the notation but let's just write it down first probably that x is equal to x given that y is equal to 2 as a 
function of x. So I'm going to denote that as little piece of x given y. Okay, like this. It's a lot of notation. Little x slash 2. Okay, equals this. So that means x given y, the vertical bar means the condition. And then I have to tell you the x and the y that is given. So uh, since I told you that y should equal 2 here, I'm putting the 2 in here. In general, I'll put a little y there, and I'm supposed to, and I'll just fix the little y. I actually I should put capital Y equals 2 here. Okay? Sorry, not the little y. Capital Y. And then I'll, okay, so that's how I can write that. So then I can, in general, I can talk about capital P, X, vertical bar, Y, little x, slash, little y, as a probability that x equals x, given that capital Y equals little y. All right, so that's the notation for the marginal, to me, conditional frequency function. Conditional frequency function. How would I do that? Well, what is this calculation? This is just the probability that capital X equals little x. The notation is worse than the calculation. Times and the probability of capital Y equals two divided by the probability of capital Y equals to two. That's how you. That's the definition of a condition of probability. Is the probability of the joint event divided by the probability of the given event. So, but that's just little p x and two, right? That's the joint event has probability given by the original table, little p of x and 2 divided by, then I have this, uh, the uh, piece of capital Y of 2, right, the uh, marginal probability that capital Y equals 2. So I'm going to take this probability that capital Y equals to 2, which is right here, that's the denominator, this 2 tenths right here. What am I going to divide? I'm going to divide a row, px2, the two row, by that two tenths. Okay? So we take this row and then divide it by this number. Does that make sense? No, no, no. I'm sorry, I'm going to take this column and divide it by that number. You got the wrong thing. No, I don't. Yeah, this column, because x. Because again, x goes in a column. I, I messed myself up. X is running in a column. So x runs this way. 0, 1, 2, 3. Okay? So I'm taking the, these numbers and I'm normalizing them by the, the sum, which is 2 tenths. So that's, that's easy. Right? And that gives you a probability frequency function. Because obviously, when I normalize these numbers by the sum, I get something that adds up to 1. So P sub x of x. Uh, put the capital Y here, slash 2, then it's simply 1 tenth divided by 2 tenths, 1 tenth divided by 2 tenths, and 0, 0, which is simply 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0, 0. So that's a probability frequency function. Okay, so we have to add up, these have to add up to 1. These add up to 1. These add up to one. So you can just extend this table. Get five marginal, five margins here, five margins down there. Okay? Everybody see that? Alright, so that's all the calculations you can do. So what does this look like in the continuous case? when I, uh, this, this is an integration in the bottom, right? This is a summation. This is an integration. So how do you find the marginal density function? That would be the first thing. The marginal density function, given f of x and y, how do you find the margin? Well, I guess the author goes this way. This is probably the best way to do it. So marginal and conditional PDFs. First, 
do you start with the, the way the author does? He starts with the CDF, okay? In the continuous case, jointly continuous case. Because I'm talking about two random variables, so I can talk about, I use the word jointly. f of x and y is equal to minus infinity to x, integral minus infinity to y, f of u of v, dv du is the representation of the joint cumulative distribution function. Then, but to find the marginal distribution function, officially it would be like this, capital F of x, then the marginal CDF would be I would integrate, I would say that's the probability that capital X is less than X. That's what it is. It's just the distribution function of capital X. And we also call it the marginal distribution function of capital X. But then that's just the probability that capital X is less than the little x and capital Y is less than infinity. The Y is something. Right? That I get to put in for free. Because Y has to be something. So this is intersecting this event with the whole space. But then that's just integration. That's just, therefore, the joint CDF f of x and infinity. Okay. That's another way of writing it. Which is integral minus infinity to x, integral minus infinity to infinity, f of u of v, dv du. I don't know. I'm using the v and the u because I got the upper limits of integration as x and y. Okay, you don't care. All right, you put it in x, y then. That's fine. <laughs> Um, I'm trying to be mathematical, but then, then, so then the density function would simply be the derivative of this uh, marginal CDF. The, the marginal density function would be the derivative of this one, so I have to take the derivative of this integral. Well, really what you have is that you've just got some expression here, and then you're integrating that from minus infinity to x. This is a function of u, right? You've integrated out the v. So this is a function of u. So this is something. Look at all that. Uh, this is some g of u, right? Okay. And you're integrating that du minus infinity to x. Well, how do I take the derivative? Then I just get g of x. Okay. So this is equal to g of x. Okay equals integral minus, how do I get g of x because I put the u equals x, minus infinity to infinity f of x, v, dv, okay, which you can now put the v equals the y, because now the y is gone, okay? So now, I could have put it here as well, because the y was gone, so I could have put this as a y, okay? That would have been okay, too, okay? <laughs> And then I'll call that G of U, so then I'll put the Y in here. Okay. So in other words, you integrate out the Y. It's exactly, uh, that's what you did, only we integrated out the X over here. Okay, in the, in the screen case, we were integrating out the X, because that was the way I made my table. Okay. I, uh, to integrate out the other variable. And so that's all I do, I integrate out the other variable. That's a very simple formula, which I think you all remember from the previous probability course. Okay. That's the margin CDF. What is the conditional? Maybe I should just do one example before we get to conditional. Uh, let's do the last well, a couple of examples here at the end of middle three. Okay. Well, here's an easy one. Let's find, let's take uh, easy and quick one. Let's take the joint uh, density to be x plus y on the unit square. It does turn out to be a joint density. Maybe we should check that. So we get a little double integration, and this is going to be a real easy double integration. So let's take f of x, y equals x plus y, where 0 less root of x less root of 1, and 0 less root of y less root of 1, and 0 else. And one, uh, verify f is a joint density. And that's, and 
How would I verify this joint density? I'm sure the area is not. Okay, yeah. <coughs> the volume on the surface is equal to x y. I think I have a picture in my notes somewhere. This, basically, it's it's probably by volume, right? Yeah. Volume under the surface is equal to f of x y. So if you wanted to draw a picture, you would just do that. You would uh, take z equals x plus y. <laughs> okay, and make a picture. Isn't that a pretty easy point to do? When x is zero? Let's try it. Z equals y, so yeah, it's like this, like this, like this, like this. This roof is supported on this unit square here at the point. Okay, can you sort of what? roof no. x plus y? This point sitting above the ground like this. <laughs> a square root. A slanted roof. A slanted roof, yeah. Slanted. You just, I mean, it has to be, you would take the square basically and lift it up. Okay, a slanted roof. Of course, now this, the length of this side is more than one. Right? I have a bit of arithmetic <laughs> Okay. But anyway, it's, so you have to stretch it out a little bit to get it. The area of the roof is not the same as the area of the square, right? So you have to stretch that square, you know, lift it up, stretch it out, so it is a little shadow would be exactly the square. That's your point, <laughs> okay? <clears throat> okay, so the volume under these, underneath that surface should be one. Okay? So you're looking at the, at the roof from underneath. I guess it can be, right? Yeah. Underneath. So how would I verify? So I need to verify that one, then I need to verify the double integral of 0 to 1, 0 to 1, x plus y, dy dx is equal to 1. Okay? Total volume under the surface is 1. And uh, obviously it's not negative. So I believe that's all I need to do, and these wise continue. So I'll design the check. So let's say I do the dy integral first. Oh, that always put dy in, so I always do the y integral first. <laughs> okay. So let's see. So that's xy plus y squared over 2. If I just use my top 3, y goes from 0 to 1. And then I integrate that 0 to 1 in, in x. And let's see, that's something pretty easy. That comes out to be x plus a half, x goes from 0 to 1, which comes out to be 1 half plus a half plus 1. So there you verified that it was a joint density. Pretty easy example. Now, uh, what is the marginal density? Well, you already did it. This is this, <laughs> okay, because the inner integral integrate out y. So f sub x of 2, f sub x of x is x plus a half. Uh, and what is the range of x? 0 to 1. 0 to 1. How would you find the range of x in general? It doesn't change. Well, okay, you might have, for example, you might have, you're going to have in your problem, for example, uh, a uniform distribution on a diamond. Do you always know that the area is equal to 1? That's like how you would get ranges? Uh, the area, well, I mean, if you have a uniform distribution on a diamond like this, you have to take the area of the diamond and invert it to get the actual, con you know, that would tell you what the density itself is. In other words, the 
constant C, F of C, F equals C on the diamond and zero else. You'd have to, and C would be the, it would be the reciprocal of the area of the diamond. Okay, that's the different issue. That's the value of C of the density. Okay. So this is a uniform distribution, but how would I uh, f of x y? Okay, but how would I what would be the range if in other words x has a range and y has a range? How would I know what those ranges would be? How would I find the marginal densities? Depends on the wiring trade. Yeah, so, so in other words, what I do here, I mean, it's a little tricky. What you do is you, if I want to find f of x of x, I have to integrate minus infinity to infinity f of x, y, dy. Right? That was just integrated from 0 to 1 f of x, y, dy over here. Why was that? I kind of tricked you. I didn't show you a picture. I fix x. Okay. And what I have to do now is I have to integrate from minus infinity to infinity in y. Underneath this function, or under this z equals f of x and y. Well, x is frozen and y is the variable. So z equals f of x and y. So if you think about it, the function, the slice of the surface, then when x is fixed, it looks like this, because it's a constant density. Okay, so I'm, I'm integrating from minus infinity to infinity. We can find the area under this curve, okay? Here we see this, this height, this constant height coming out of the board. That's the z direction. Can you see that? Maybe you can't. So I'm thinking of my y-axis here, okay, going vertical parallel to this y-axis. And then my z direction is coming out of the board, and there's a height of a surface z equals f of x and y. That's the constant height. And the constant here, which is the c. This height is c. Okay. I have to look sideways because I'm thinking of this curve coming out of the board. Okay? Now I'm integrating, I'm finding the area under that curve. Okay. So obviously I only have to integrate from here to here. Okay? Because I'm integrating zero out here, so then I have to find. So then I have, so I have to uh, break this down. Then I'll put C. Then I'll put a boundary here. So this would be some uh, minus y of x, and or, you know it'll be in general a g of x and an h of x here. Okay, dy. Right. Two boundaries. So then now, what is the range of x? That was the original question, right? Mm -hmm. Well, whatever x can go to, right? Now, get something. Mm -hmm. For any x between this minus, one to one. minus uh, point to this plus point here. In other words, what you can think of is all the dots. Here's how you can think of the density of x. Geometrically, you've got all the dots in here. Those are all your random pairs, okay, that you might have sampled, all right? Or visualizing your data set. You've got all these random pairs in your data set. Now, what are the possible values of x? We just project all these onto the x-axis, right? And you get all, the, all just the x values, and then and you get a bunch of, and obviously it's a higher density in the middle. That you can figure out if you're trying to, right? It has to be. So, I mean, what would the density look like? I mean, there's more dots in the middle, right? When you project all these onto the x-axis, just squash the thing. Put the dots on the x-axis. Okay, well, but obviously x goes from the minus boundary to the right boundary. So you just take projection of the region onto the x-axis. That gives you the range of x. Take the projection of the region onto the y-axis. That gives you the range of y. So that's the general situation. Okay. Okay. Um, five minutes or four minutes. Not even that. Are we done? Two minutes. Okay. What did we not cover? What we didn't cover was something like uh, cupula. What's a cupula? <laughs> this is uh, almost a cupula. <laughs> it's this, this canopy. Okay. A cupula is like something that. What is a cupula? It's like a. Isn't it kind of like a uh, an arch? 
march to dome or something like that. Anybody ever tell you what that is? Okay, we'll look it up in the dictionary. <laughs> Project. Okay. But what you can, it turns out that what you can do is that the question is um, do the marginal distributions determine the joint, joint distribution? No, they don't. The marginal distributions do not determine the joint distribution. Certainly not. In other words, you can have. Uh, the same marginals for lots of different joint distributions. So, for example, if I take um, the following, uh, the following little c of u and v equals to the following uh, one plus alpha one minus two u one minus two v. I put these in notes for this little hint. Okay, this is going to help you with one of your problems. If I take this little joint density, this is a joint density for any alpha between minus 1 and 1. This is a joint density for any alpha and the value less than 1. It makes sense that it's at least not negative because um, if you, uh, with minus u, excuse me, u between 0 and 1, and p between 0 and 1. So the, the, the region for this joint density is going to be the unit squared. Is that really a joint thing? Well, you have to integrate it, right? Integrate it in uh, u and v. Notice how it works out. If I fix u, all right, integrated v because of the symmetry, 1 minus 2v, as v goes from 0 to 1, it's just going to go to 0, okay? So this term is going to integrate to 0, and I do my double integral, okay? And I just get a double integral of 1. The alpha has to be between, is less than or equal to 1, so that this stays to be a non-negative function, otherwise you always just integrate to 1. That's a joint density, and it turns out the marginal is just a constant, 1. So if I take the marginal, integral c u of v, dv, 0 to 1, it could about be 1. No matter what alpha is, that means that I'm getting the uniform marginals. No matter what alpha is. Integral c u v du, 0 to 1. So that turns out to be, so you can get, um, uh, a whole class, a whole one parameter family of densities that each have the uniform marginals, okay? It's not hard to see that there are, uh, that at least the marginals do not determine the joint distribution. Just go back to that. That picture I had with all the one tenths in there, and so on. It had the zeros in there. Zero, 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 zero in the lower right hand corner. Okay, what were the, the marginals were four tenths, three tenths, two tenths, and one tenth. Can I get those same marginals with a different pattern in the inside? Sure. How? Well, the easiest way is by putting the independent structure. In other words, just multiply. So I can get a different table by multiplying. 4 tenths times 4 tenths is 16 over 100, right? 4 tenths times 3 tenths is 12 over 100. 9 over, excuse me, uh, 8 over 100, 4 over 100. So I'm multiplying the 4 tenths times the 3 tenths, the 2 tenths, the 1 tenth, and the 4 tenths. So I'm putting the independent structure, just get a joint, just take the product of the frequency functions. That'll give you a joint frequency function, right? It has to. And what are the margins of a, of a product of, of, of two functions like that? They're just going to be the original ones. If I, if I make the independent structure, then the margin will just get back what I started with. 
so I can do this, 1200s, uh, 8100s, 4100s, uh, 12, that'll be 9, 6, and 3. It'll be 8, 6, 4, and 2, 100s, 2.06, and 0, 4, 0, 0.02, and then finally, 0, 0.03, 0, 0.02, 0, 0.01. There's a table. And it has exactly the same marginals. Check it out. 16 plus 12 is 28, and 8 is 36, and 4 is 40. 40 over 100 is 4 tenths. And so, okay, if you don't believe me. So, you can always construct the independence table, right? With your products. The independence structure. The structure, the joint frequency function for independent random variables. You can always construct that. But obviously, it's not the only one you can construct that has those marginals. So, that's you know, a simpler example even than this cupula example, right? This is so-called so cupula example. I don't know if I can call that, but 